Hello everyone. My name is Lee Godden and I am the person introducing the event, but on behalf of the Centre for Resources, Energy and Environmental Law at the University of Melbourne, in working in association with the people who have been involved in producing this wonderful film that we're about to see, uh, the people who've been involved in the River Murrabool uh, project and the film. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters on which the law school is situated and on which I'm also situated, which is Jaja Warung country for today. I'd like to give a few brief um, introductory points to the uh, film and the event today before I hand over to people uh, who will be taking us forward. In particular, Erin O'Donnell will be the moderator and I'll hand over for a more fulsome welcome to country shortly. But if I could just alert everyone uh, who has joined us on this webinar and thank you, we have had a wonderful response uh, to the webinar, but just to let you know that it is being recorded. So um, we have that running now. So just uh, before I hand over then, um, this event is the Melbourne launch of the River Murrabool film. Uh, it was made by People for a Living Murrabool and She Oaks Film. And it's a compelling film exploring the consequences of water demands on the river, particularly in the face of climate change. And it features interviews with local landowners, scientists and Healthy Rivers advocates. Um, can I ask, uh, once you have enjoyed looking at the film, what we will do is um, have a Q&A session and attendees are encouraged to put their questions in the Q&A and we'll open up for questions as I noted at the end of the screening. So I'd uh, now like to hand over to Tony Garvey, uh, a Wanjiroi Woi Warung elder to do the official welcome to country. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you very much for that welcome. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say Wuminjika to everyone. So Wuminjika means welcome in the Wurrung or Wurundjeri language. So welcome to all Indigenous and non-Indigenous people here for this very important event. Also, just like to say the Wurundjeri people are also a part of the Kulin Nation. So Kulin means men. In the Kulin Nation, there were five language groups. There was the Wurrung to the west, the Koorong, who were the Wesley neighbours to the Wadarong, Tanarong to the northeast, Bunarong to the southwest, and the Wurrung of the Wurundjeri territory that we stand on here today. The Wurundjeri lies within the cities of Melbourne. It extends from the mountains of the Great Dividing Range, south to the Yarra River, west to the Werribee River, and east to Mount Borbore. The Wurundjeri people, they have a social totem. It is Bunjil the Eagle. Bunja represents spiritual powers throughout many parts of Australia. Bunja taught all the laws about life, behaviour and ceremonies to make sure that our culture would continue for all walks of life throughout Australia. Bunja is referred to as the creator of mankind. Bunja created great people from the land and that is why we call the land our mother or the mother of creation. Never can the land be taken away. The land will always belong to Aboriginal people as we are part of the land and the land is part of us. Our story is similar to yours. Yours is by your chosen faith. Ours is by the dream time. We both have creators and beliefs and ours is Bunjil. It is a traditional custom of the Australian Aboriginal communities to be asked and to give permission for people to enter their land. And today you have now joined with me to honour the spirits of my ancestors, past, present and merging, who have nurtured this land for over 60,000 years. And we as the custodians of the land offer your heartly welcome to the land and hope that together as citizens of this beautiful country, we can build, develop and unite stronger nations for all people. And finally, I would just like to close in my Wurrung language, which is Wemitika, which means you are most welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri 
people. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thanks, um, Tony. Um, I'm Stephen Oakes, uh, one of the filmmakers, along with um, Ian Penner. Um, it's been an absolutely amazing journey to have produced this um, 45-minute uh, documentary over many years, um, I'd say about six or seven years. In fact, the uh, the song for the um, that runs at the end is um, was written by my partner uh, Lisa probably about five or six years ago. So, and certainly the lyrics um, almost foretold our our journey along the length of the river. Um, it's the people that have come along with us, uh, particularly Cameron Steele and um, Ian, um, have been fantastic to work with, with their amazing uh, knowledge and passion for the river. And as a filmmaker and a composer for the, the work and, and the editing with Ian, um, I've learned a lot about the power of filmmaking um, along the way. And uh, uh, that journey did start about 12 years ago with a, a little film um, called uh, Lost Waters, which was based on uh, Erica Nathan's book, and she appears at the end of the, the film too. So it's been a really uh, long journey with the Moorable, and it's been a, a pleasure to go from living out there in the Meredith area to continuing that relationship and to feel that the river itself is a living entity and um, I think that comes across in the film. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy this screening, which is uh, introduced by uh, Maud Barlow, who was also um, I met first uh, all those years ago uh, when we were making that first little documentary. So, yeah, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you everyone um, for joining us in the Melbourne launch of the River Moorable. Um, that's an incredibly beautiful and powerful film and we are really honoured to be part of the Melbourne launch of that film today. Um, thank you also for joining us for this Q&A session with some of the people behind the film as well as some experts in water law and policy. Uh, my name is Erin O'Donnell, I'm uh, at the Melbourne Law School. Um, I'm also an expert in water law and policy so that's very exciting. Um, I would like to begin by paying my respects to all of the Aboriginal people joining us today and acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Eastern Ma country. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and I acknowledge that they have never ceded their rights to lands and waters. I'm gonna introduce our panel, um, our fabulous panel, um, and then we're gonna hear briefly from someone who's um, on the panel but unfortunately can't be here with us today before we move into some Q&A. So just as a reminder, um, if you've got questions for any of the panellists as a result of the film or the conversation that we're about to have, please pop those into the Q&A um, box on your screen and I'll come up um, and, and bring those questions up to the panel as we work through. So joining us today, uh, we have Peter Stray, farmer and president of the Geelong Land Care Network. Um, we have Rebecca Nelson, who's an associate professor in water law and environment law at the Centre for Resources, Environment and Energy Law at the Melbourne Law School. We have Cameron Steele, the coordinator for People for a Living Moorable, or PALM. Uh, Juliet Lefevre, Healthy Rivers campaigner. Um, Barry Gilson, Wadawurrung. Now, Barry is not here with us today, so we'll be playing a short recording from him in a second. Um, and of course, we're, you've already heard from Stephen Oakes, the film producer at She Oaks Films. And we are also joined by Ian Penner, a landowner in the Moorable catchment and film producer as well. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, sadly, Barry is not able to join us, but he has recorded a short message that I thought we'd open with, um, just to, to reflect a little bit on his perspective as a Wadawurrung man. Hooey, I'm Barry Gilson. I'm a Wadawurrung man. I live on a tributary of the Mirable River, I have all my life. It's at uh, Paddock Creek, it's at Gordon, under the shadow of Kirat Barit. Now, there used to be about uh, 70 bunia, or short fin deals down there at any given time when I was a child. Now they dammed the Bostock, uh, the Murrumbah River at the Bostock Reservoir, and uh, it also got rid of the Timbu, which is the um, freshwater mussels. These things are a part of our story, 
and have been for thousands of years and they're not there anymore. Now we have to get it together to save this river and uh, so we can um, tell stories about the river of ghosts. Not yet, Barry Gilson. And thank you to Barry for that. Um, I really appreciate his generosity in agreeing to record that short statement to share with us today. Um, so I'm now going to ask some questions of our fabulous panel. And Peter, I'm going to start with you. Um, firstly, um, how the, are the platypus still there? Um, you spoke about the platypus on that film. Um, Yes, they are still there. Uh, they're very elusive creatures to find, of course, but uh, yeah, we do see them occasionally, for sure. Oh, fantastic. And can you tell us a little bit, as a farmer in the Moorabool, what does the river mean to you? Yeah, well, I suppose on the most basic level, um, the, the river is our water source for our livestock and uh, uh, the house and garden. Um, we don't have any irrigation or anything like that, but um, yeah, it is very important for us on that level. But uh, you know, just as importantly, uh, and more importantly, in a lot of ways, it's also um, a, a bio link to uh, for uh, species to uh, um, traverse between uh, the the north and the south um, a wildlife corridor. Uh, it's also you know, a place of very special beauty. Um, as you've seen, like, we are fortunate to live in one of the, the better parts of the Moorable. And um, yeah, and I think it's also extremely important for mental well-being, particularly having um, water, a good amount of water in the river as there, there is at the moment with the, the rainfall that we've been having. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, now my next question goes to Juliet. And Juliet, I'd like to ask you how the Moorable compares to the health of rivers across Victoria. Well, you heard it on the movie, most flow stress river in Victoria. So that's a pretty uh, uh, horrible title to hold. And what does that actually mean? It means it gives up so much of its water for other uses. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not alone. Many of our rivers work really hard. The Yarra in, here in Melbourne, gives up you know, 50% in an average year. And the problem is that in the dry years, the percentage goes up all the time. So when the river is most stressed by the climate, it's also when most water is taken out of it. So the impact of drought, I mean, you know, our rivers are well adapted to boom and bust, but the impact of drought is greatly magnified by um, you know, extraction for human use. It's made 20, the impact of drought has made 20 times worse because we're taking water out of our rivers at such a high rate and all the more so. And you know, we saw on the film how the Moorable could just be turned off, literally close the sluice on the dam, no water comes down. And that is just a terrible thing to do to a river, to cut off its supply when it most needs it. And the river is, needs to be a river. It needs to have water coming down it. Planting trees along the bank is great. It's fantastic, but it's pointless without the water in the river. So when the Moorabal is in a pretty poor state, but it has got one fantastic asset. The people who made this film, who put their money where their mouth is and speak up for their river. And that is just a fantastic thing for a river to have. It really is. Um, I think a, the community of people who live along and love rivers is a big part of the success of, um, of healthy river campaigning. Um, so moving on to Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, can you tell us about some water law reforms that could perhaps help to better protect the Moorable River? Yeah, so first I'd just like to start by offering my congratulations to the makers and the participants of the film. It's really beautiful, really thought provoking. Um, and also just let you know that I'm being in from Wurundjeri country today and acknowledge uh, and pay my respects to Wurundjeri elders past, present and emerging. So in thinking about that question of water law reforms, really a couple of things struck me about the film. The first was how it diagnosed the threats to the Moorabool, um, the fact that there was no single explanation. So the film points to a bore field in the upper catchment, farm dams, diversions for municipal, municipal use and climate change. 
So in other words, this is a problem of cumulative effect. It's the aggregate effect of multiple causes of harm that sum up to the state of the moorable as it is today. And law tends to struggle with cumulative environmental problems. The reason being law tends to deal with things in silo. So we've got separate laws for biodiversity, separate from water quantity, separate from water quality. And when you have a situation of death by a thousand cuts, healing one of those cuts isn't going to be enough to, to fix the problem in its entirety. And even worse than that, the connections between all of those different issues can be really complicated. And there's often not enough scientific information available to help decision makers operating un under those laws. And that's important because activities that could seem like they're relatively minor might be cumulatively significant. So I think our water laws could do a better job at uh, collecting and sharing scientific information and other information about the values of the river and probably should facilitate more investment in the kind of science that lets decision makers join the dots between issues that they would otherwise deal with separately. The second thing that really struck me was the importance of groundwater to the flows of the Moorabool, as we heard in the film. Uh, so we heard that the bore field in the upper catchment is essentially sucking out the water that should discharge to the Moorabool. And that's a pretty striking problem from a legal perspective, because not only do we have these separate silos dealing with separate issues of law, traditionally water law has also dealt with groundwater quite separately than surface water. So how do you join those dots? Well, I think, you know, the good news is that lots of jurisdictions, including Victoria, have good tools for doing that. The challenge, though, is that we often don't have a legal mandate for governments to use those tools or to revise them when things change. So, for example, in Victoria, we've got uh, laws that allow for caps on aggregate groundwater extraction called permissible consumptive volumes. Traditionally, those caps were not set with base flows in mind. They weren't thinking about the moorable, and they also weren't even necessarily thinking about the environment at all. So in this day and age, I think that's quite shocking. Uh, so water reforms would ideally address those issues. Um, but even without reforms like that, I think it's really important to note that communities can lobby for changes to those legally binding caps and to other sorts of tools that can help. And, and that's where I'd like to close, just by underscoring the importance of community action. Uh, and, and I think this film's a really important, important part of galvanizing the community into action. So congratulations again. Thank you. Um, now, before I move on, I just wanted to add to some of Rebecca's comments there. I think the role of law in, in water policy and, and river protection is changing very rapidly. Um, and Rebecca's highlighted a few really important um, elements that we can focus on for change. One of the areas that is starting to change as well is the recognition of rivers as a living entity. And we heard that throughout the film today um, and seeing rivers in that holistic way. And the law is also starting to see rivers in that holistic way. So this, this connection between people and place, between people and rivers can also find its way into the law. And so with that, I'd like to direct the next question to Cameron. Um, what message do you most want people to hear from this film? Well, um, thanks, Aaron. F firstly, is uh, the very selfish thing about um, we've got a river that we're very extremely fond of that we've been fighting for well over a decade for um, and really keeping its profile up there, um, certainly in the face of the public, but also in the face of politicians. Uh, people who drive from Ballarat to Geelong don't realise we've got this beautiful river just in the valley next to them and raising its profile is very much part of that. When we first started this journey we were told that there wasn't any money for works on the Moorable um, and even the CCMA was quite blunt that they'd written the river off. They were about, they had a limited amount of money and they were looking to protect the, the best. Um, we've hopefully as a, as a group raised the profile of the, the Moorable uh, to where that's no longer the case. Um, but we're, we're also wanting to show that this is a river um, which is the canary in the coal mine in so many respects. Um, the saturation of farm dams um, is, a, is an area that the government doesn't seem to want to touch. But here we've got a river that's deeply impacted by farm dams. So our hope is that 
um, our, the story of the Moorable and the solutions for the Moorable will inform solutions for other rivers and perhaps stop them from becoming like the Moorable. But ultimately, we want to see the, the river return to being a river, which it isn't at the moment. Now, the government is preparing at the moment um, a draft sustainable water strategy. Um, and this could be released really at any time, um, as far as we know. So I just wanted to ask um, maybe Juliet and Cameron, if you can speak to, have you been involved in this strategy? Um, what do you hope the strategy will do um, for the health of the Moorable in the future? Uh, look, sorry about my unstable connection, it seems, but uh, uh, look, for the Swiss has to recognise the, the state of the river and, and you know, the earlier Swiss did a good job of that. Um, and there were some messages in that that we, we felt really set the river up to be, you know, uh, its future to be at least uh, advanced. Um, we've had a terrible um, uh, decrease in the amount of water flowing into this river. And so the river was at an emergency stage 10 years ago. It's so much more an emergency state now and we're really seeking that the Swiss step up. Um, it's got to step up on the question of allocations. Uh, we're, we're seeking adaptive bulk entitlements. We're seeking drawing the line under farm dams. We're, we're seeking a whole bunch of stuff from the Swiss. And you know, the last Swiss had a lot of hope in it. Um, it took some brave steps and we're hoping for this Swiss to be equally as brave, um, to really confront the issues facing not only the Moorable, but other rivers, and really put a firm pathway to securing a future for it. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that. What I want to see out of this strategy is a real acknowledgement of the, where we're at. As Cameron said, you know, we were in you know, a crisis 10 years ago and things have just gone downhill since then. You know, things have got worse, not better. So yeah, we're in a, we need that acknowledgement that we just cannot go on doing things the way that we do it. It's not a magic pudding. It's a limited resource and it's getting smaller and the rivers are the ones which are feeling caught in the front of it. And the other thing is, you know, the, 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 the strategy covers a large region. It's, it's all, it's Gippsland, it's right through Melbourne, it's right down to the Otway. So there's rivers from uh, the Gellibrand and the Otways all the way around to the East Gippsland River. So it's an enormous area. Different rivers have got different problems, but the common thread is that we've got to stop handing out water. We've got to, we've got to get water back into our rivers, not take more stuff out of them. So I'm going to come back to that point in a second, um, but I'm just going to switch tack slightly here and talk about riparian zone rehabilitation. So one of the questions that's come up in the chat has been, about how many farmers own properties along the river that are engaged in riparian zone rehabilitation. So Peter, I wonder if you could um, speak to that. Yeah, well, I suppose like everything else, it, uh, it varies landholder to landholder, but uh, there are quite a number of uh, properties now that, that are doing um, stuff and uh, getting a, a decent uh, riparian zone along it is, is probably the, the biggest problem. There's, there's still people who would just like to um, fence off the, the minimum and so that they leave them with the most available for livestock or cropping or, or whatever it might be. But yeah, there's certainly been quite a bit done in, um, in recent years and we saw uh, uh, Ralph Cotter talk about the, the Morrible Gorge recovery program that uh, he was involved with uh, some years ago. There, there was a lot of money that uh, came with that. That uh, um, yeah, through the CMAs, there, there is money available, and uh, yeah, it is being taken up in um, in some circumstances. Great. Is there more that could be done to encourage it? Oh, there's always more that can be done. There is no doubt about that. And more money um, is certainly a part of that. Um, yeah, it's uh, a lot of education still needs to be done too. There's um, uh, to really uh, make sure that we're hitting the mark with making sure that landholders know the, 
the uh, the benefits to them and also the uh, the wider community benefits and, and environmental benefits of doing so and just the way it makes you feel too because we've done quite a bit in the in the last um, few years and um, yeah just look being able to look at that patch and, and get that real um, feel good feeling inside it, that you've uh, done something positive is, is uh, yeah it's it's really good aspect of it yeah that positive feedback so important um mm. now moving back to this question then that juliet raised around um we have to figure out ways to stop taking the water out of the rivers um, one of the questions that's come through in the chat is whether we need to start facing some hard decisions around demand management um, and whether desalination plants and urban reuse will only get us so far. So I'm going to open that one up fairly widely. Um, does anybody want to put up their hand to, to have a first response? I'm seeing Juliet lean in. I might go to you. Oh, Juliet and then, and then Cameron. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the things we have to be looking at is uh, what are the alternatives? I mean, we, in the film, we heard about desal and rainwater, uh, stormwater capture and recycling, and these are all critically important. I mean, you know, cities have to be able to supply themselves with water, reuse what they, you know, send it round again, not just send it through once. And that, you know, desalination is just a, a larger extension of that loop of sending the water around again. So, you know, the cities have to be able to take care of themselves. I mean, the farms, uh, you know, we need to be thinking along the same lines for the farms. And what can they do to, uh, you know, to rehydrate their landscapes? I and mean, that's one of the real problems that we're facing, desiccation of the landscapes. The landscape, you know, there's less and less water held within it. And so the farmers need to be looking at, well, what can we do in, in that basis? I'll hand it over to the others now. Um, Cameron, I'm going to go to you, and then I, I thought I might come back to Peter to talk about um, what people can do on farm to hold water in, in the land. Uh, fingers crossed on my connection. Um, look, uh, demand management um, for the uh, future of the Moorabal is well down the tree, unfortunately. It, it was something I think we all have to live sustainably, and I'm, I'm very much for uh, making the maximum use of this really precious resource. But we're looking to expand our population, as was said in the film, by double. So if, if we all really put the hard yards in and, and reduce our water consumption by 10% over the next 10 years, um, that's going to get gobbled up straight away by the population increase. So um, in, in a way, I, I've been saying we... We, we mustn't get diverted um, uh, by you know, thinking that demand management will be a fix for the river. It won't. The, the river needs its allocation to, to maintain its health. Um, I, I think it's a, a really important um, thing that we, you know, uh, stormwater reuse and stormwater capture, and there's some, been really some exciting things done by water authorities. But the, that population question really puts all that down the tree. Um, we've, we've got a, um, the DELP came up with a figure, which I, I think they still use, which says that if a river's had over 30% of its flow taken from it, it enters into being flow stressed. Um, as I pointed out, by the time it, the Morable Reach Batesford, it's got 90% of its water taken. Those are the figures that we need to concentrate on. And we, as Juliet said, we need to let this river get back to being a river and, and looking after all the things that rely on it. And if humans take, uh, restrict their take to one third or 30%, um, we're going to have a vastly different river. So yes, demand management's really important, but for securing the future, um, there's other things we need to get done before that. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Peter, did you want to touch quickly on this, um, on the work that farmers can do to keep water in the landscape? Yeah, maybe I might just touch on demand first though, because um, I've got to say that the amount of development that is going on, I find quite sickening really. Um, it's just so much of the landscape is going to be covered in, in houses uh, around the, the Geelong and Ballarat areas. Um, you know, 
in history, something like the COVID pandemic would have been the thing that rebalanced things as far as population goes. But we've got too clever now, so we've got to learn to, to do it ourselves as far as um, you know controlling our the size of our own population. So um, yeah, that's um, you know, that's a, a very big issue because there's not a not a uh, uh, ecosystem on the planet that hasn't been adversely affected by the the size of our population. So. Now that's you know obviously a much bigger issue than can be dealt with here today. But so back to the um, uh, the thing about what can be done on farms. Well, yeah, as I mentioned in the film, that uh, you know we have lost so much carbon out of the the landscape, and carbon, particularly in the soils, is uh, very much what um, helps store water in soils, um, trees, and things on the landscape. Um, reduce evaporation and so forth so um yeah a, a big focus on carbon not just for uh um climate change purposes but also for you know for rivers and things like that is um is going to have to be necessary in the future and uh yeah also mentioned about the, the farm dams you know it's been common practice over you know many years for farms to dig uh, a small hole in, in each dam so that the in each uh, sorry in each paddock so that um, uh, livestock have access to water all the time well you know we've got to uh, maybe look at reversing some of that and um, you know if we try to uh, take water away from farmers so that they don't have enough well it, it's just not going to work because it, it, uh, it won't be allowed to happen but um, the idea of building much deeper dams that, you know, that have the, a much greater volume to surface area so we don't lose so much water in evaporation, that are surrounded by vegetation that can become you know, real ecosystems in themselves. You know, it has, it's got to be a win-win situation and you know, solar pumps and windmills and things are all uh, very affordable now so um, yeah they're all things that can be done and um, but yeah I think that the farmers do need a bit of financial help because it is a a, uh, a broader community issue as well as just on farm so yeah. Thank you. Um, Rebecca I know you've done some work on the Barwon Downs issue is there anything from your work there that could be transferable to the future of the Moorabool? Oh, look, I think the, the lesson from my experience there is really the community works so hard for probably two decades to draw attention to the, the ecological degradation that was happening because of that ball field. And it did work in the end. Um, there's now a, a, an emergency declaration that prevents the pumping that was causing that ecological degradation. But that's a short term measure. And it's a long-term problem. The, the moorable degradation is a long-term problem in the same way that um, was the case in the Barwon Downs. And so I think we need to be thinking about long-term solutions. And, you know, there are so many ideas that are really valuable that the film raises, but ultimately where the rubber hits the road is who's going to pay for them. They, they all cost money. Um, and, you know, for government's role, they will need to get the money from somewhere too. So is it going to be increases in the prices of people's water bills? Is it going to be people in Melbourne paying for, um, for changes? You know, I, I think that's, that's really where there are big questions. Who, who's going to pay? So that's a, a really good point. I just want to flag one of the, um, the comments that has been made in the chat, uh, which comes from Tim Fletcher. Um, he talks about the fact that Geelong and Melbourne both create excess um, stormwater compared to their demand. So not only potentially are Geelong and Melbourne a source of future funding for work on the Moorable, but could be a future source of, of freeing up some water um, through the, the grid that connects both of those cities. So I think, yeah, definitely some, some big ideas to think about. Um, one of the other questions that's popped up in the chat is the role of Barwon Water. Um, and whether whether they've been involved in the film process so far, um, yeah, what the relationship is with Bowen Water going on. Um, Cameron, this might be a question for you. Um, thanks, yeah. I, I uh, have sat on the um, incarnations of the Bowen 
um, Bow and Water Environment Consultative Committee for uh, many, many years. Um, and certainly at the moment, they're responsive um, to uh, the plight of the, the Moorable. Um, we've taken the Bow and Water team uh, uh, along with the CEO on the Moorable and, and um, certainly highlighted the, the river's plight. Um, they're obviously in between government, uh, water bills, uh, price of water, and doing the right thing by the environment. Um, I, I think they've lifted their sense of stewardship over rivers like the Moorable. Um, I think they recognise that uh, there's some really, I mean, we are going to have to go to sources of manufactured water, um, whether that's through desal, stormwater reuse, or um, uh, uh, recycled water. Um, so what we haven't sort of hitched ourselves to any one of those. We, we believe in letting the water authority work that out, but there's even, you know, back to Tim's point on, on stormwater reuse, um, the bar and water were quite prominent in um, uh, formulating up an integrated water management plan for the west and north growth areas for uh, Geelong. And part of that was freeing up water from stormwater reuse to go up the valley to winemakers like the one uh, uh, Richard Austin, who was uh, in the film. And look, ideally, you know, if, if that went to um, someone like him and he was able to then um, release his allocation out of the Moorable, that would be a, a great win for the river. And we need to see more of that. And, and so, um, bar and water, I, I think we're, we're, uh, we're always encouraging them. Um, and I, I think they, but they will be definitely part of the sorting out the future for the Moorable. And um, hopefully they're going to step up to that role. So I think a, a couple of quick questions to, to maybe finish up. Um, firstly, we've had a question about how you, people, how you gathered some community momentum. Um, so we've talked about how this has been a, a project that's 12 years really in the making. Um, but is, is there anything you can say about how to, how to bring the community together? People are asking if, whether there's, there's things that they can learn from your experience on the Moorable. Um, and I'd open this to, um, yeah, to really all the people who've been involved in, in putting the film together. Go for it, Cameron. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I, raising awareness is just such a vital part of this. And um, I'd, I'd just like to say, um, take my hat off personally to Stephen and Ian uh, for producing the film. Um, the, the previous iteration of this film back nearly 10 years ago that um, they both produced, I, I've, we, we go to um, local council um, uh, councillors and to council meetings. And I remember 10 years ago going to a council meeting and um, I'm in the Golden Plains and there's a lot of farmers with their arms crossed uh, who were council people. And as the film played, you could just see them opening up and the, the arms were uncrossed and they were leaning forward and they really engaged in it. And the, the, the value of this as a medium, um, it's just extraordinary. So look, you know, people should look for uh, opportunities to contribute to things like submissions on the Swiss and, and raising those community voices. But you know, once the film um, is made available publicly, if that can be just, people can just pass it through their email chains and just bring that awareness, um, that'd be extraordinarily helpful. Thank you. So that actually does bring us close to time. So are there any final comments from any of the other panelists that you'd like to leave us with about what we can all do for the future of the Moorable? I, I would completely echo what Cameron's just said. When there's an opportunity to put your hand up, put your hand up, have your say, get involved with the sustainable water strategy. Let people know, even if you're not with the Moorable, if you're with the Yarra, the Maribyrnong, you know, Melbourne's other rivers, the Barwon, they all need help. And this is a big opportunity to be able to get that community voice really strong and uh, let, let the people up there know what you think. 
Can, can I just add to Juliet, um, one of the really effective things that's been happening is people have, after seeing the film, have actually written to the minister and just said, look, we've seen this film, um, just a quick email. Um, we, we want to know what you're going to do, either through the Swiss process or into the future, to um, look after this river, because we've, we've seen it, we've seen how beautiful it is, we've seen the, its plight, and you know, really putting the responsibility back on those who have the decisions, and, and um, that'd be a, a marvellous exercise if people uh, wanted to do that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think if there's something that comes through really powerfully from this film today, and it applies across the board for so many rivers in Victoria and indeed across Australia, is that our rivers are beloved. They are beloved by the people who live along them. They're beloved by the people who know them. They're beloved by traditional owners who have been living along and, and working with the rivers for tens of thousands of years. They may be highly impacted, but they are still beloved and we can do something about that. Um, there are the, One of the joys of water is that there is always a water law or water policy reform process underway. So there is always an opportunity to make things better for our rivers. So thank you so much for joining us in this conversation today. I wanna to thank the panelists for their insights, the producers for their absolutely wonderful film. Um, I really wanna thank Creel for hosting this event today. The, the film will be publicly available in about two weeks. The, um, the YouTube link will be publicly available. So we'll share that um, and continue to promote this fantastic work. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, yeah, thank you to our panelists.